I'm here on South 6th Street near Landy Street on De Pere's west side. Today, we're going to learn all about De Pere Public Works. Welcome to the Mayor's Corner. I'm Mayor James Boyd. In each episode of the Mayor's Corner, we plan to take you to explore a different part of the city of De Pere as we discuss the latest happenings in our city. Plus, we'll take a behind the scenes look at various areas of city government. Most of all, we want to show you all there is to celebrate about the city of De Pere. We're here on South 6th Street near Landy Street outside the Municipal Service Center. This building houses our Public Works Department which includes the streets, engineering, water and maintenance divisions. This space also includes city offices as well as the municipal garage for repairing and storing equipment. Usually we chat with our guests outside but since it's snowing, it's very cold, we're going to head inside and talk with Director of Public Works Scott Thorson. Join me. Hey Scott, thanks for meeting with us today. Hey Mayor, thanks for having me. It's my honor. Great, fantastic. Today we're chatting with Scott Thorson. Uh, he is the Public Works Director for the City of De Pere. Scott oversees a staff of more than 30 people who work hard to maintain every aspect of Public Works. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Thanks, Mayor. It's an honor to be here. Scott, could you give us a bit of a background um, in your role in Public Works, how you got started, how you got to De Pere, a little background on yourself. Well, absolutely. And first of all, you know, Merry Christmas to everybody out there. And here's my mascot, the Public Works mascot for this time Frosty. Of year. Frosty, Frosty is the mascot snowman, for Public Works. I, I got to tell you, I, I will tell you about Frosty, but let's talk about me a little bit. Sounds good. So, anyways, um, you know, I'm a graduate of Michigan Tech University with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, my first job out of college, I went out uh, to Seattle, my wife and I, for about five years. I worked for Washington State Department of Transportation. My wife and I are from the Midwest. We got homesick, we moved back a little bit. My first job in the public works sector was working for the city of Eau Claire. I really enjoyed, you know, when I got into it, I started off as a project engineer, um, responsible for design and constructive all the street projects, kind of like what we do here. And I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the municipal side of it, and that's when I decided, you know what, being a municipal engineer is pretty cool, and I kind of stuck to that path. So after a couple of years, I became the public works director slash city engineer for the city of Two Rivers, uh, just south of us, uh, down by in Manitowoc County. I was there for almost five years, and then in 2005, I actually started uh, my career here with the um, city of De Pere as their director of public works. So as my responsibility as the director of public works, I basically direct, administer, and supervise all our public works operations, which basically includes our street department, our water department, um, our maintenance department, um, you know, our engineering department, and then our admin team. All right. Well, a very, a very varied background and experience you bring in. You did answer my next question, um, the areas of the Public Works Department. Uh, any other areas than what you had just described to us? Sure. I'll actually elaborate a little bit more on that. And before I start, Mark, I'm going to ask you a personal question. Sure. So when you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you normally do? First thing I normally do, I guess I imagine, brush my teeth. Okay. So in the brush your teeth, uh, you got to utilize water, right? I have to utilize water, yes. So what a lot of people don't realize, that water is Public Works. Ah. So the water goes down a drain, and that drain goes into our, our pipes. That's public works. Oh. And what people don't realize, public works, you know, we impact the community and everybody on a daily basis. Whether it's the water or the drainage, every street you drive on, that's public works. Um, and then what a lot of people don't realize, we're also first responders in public works because oftentimes we're called out on emergencies, everything. This is the police department when you need street closures, or we have a stop sign down, or we have a water main break, or we actually have somebody has a clogged sewer, we get called in and we go out. So basically our public works department, as I mentioned earlier, has four different divisions. 
Um, our street division is basically comprised of uh, 12 uh, dedicated individuals and, and a manager, so 13 employees. They basically, you know, oversee the street operations with everything from garbage collection. Um, this time of year, you're going to see the snow plowing going on. They maintain streets, our street sign. Um, you know, we got a compost site. Uh, we strike, uh, you know, pavements uh, in the summer months. We're street sweeping. We do your leaf collection, brush collection, that sort of thing. Then we have our water department. So, when you turn on your faucet and that water you get, where do you think that water comes from, there? Um, I, I don't know. Where does the water come from? So a lot of people don't realize that water that uh, residents in De Pere actually drink comes from Lake Michigan down from Manitowoc. The city of Manitowoc actually supplies our water. Um, the De Pere, along with five other communities, are members of what we call the Central Brown County Water Authority. So basically that water is piped up 65 miles to De Pere and other neighboring communities such as, you know, Alloway, Ledgeview, Lawrence, uh, Bellevue, um, Howard. And once it gets to our system, we have three connection points, you know, the, basically our water uh, department takes over them. They're responsible for over 120 miles of, of water mains throughout the community. Um, basically, you know, they make sure the system is functioning. Their primary uh, function is make sure yourself and all the other uh, residents of De Pere actually have safe quality drinking water. It's amazing how much water quality standards we have to follow based off the DNR and EPA. So they make sure we have safe drinking water. They maintain the system. Um, you see them flush and hydrant. We actually have three water towers that actually the water, um, believe it or not, you know, is pumped in those towers and it's gravity fed. That's what gives you your pressure at your homes when you open up the faucet. Um, they got numerous uh, other stations and then again, you know, they got the Central Rome County. Then, you know, one of the biggest things uh, in the public works we do, we have our engineering division. Um, we have, a, you know, that's a staff of uh, seven employees that basically plan, design, and construct all our street projects that are going on. Um, every year we get people cursing because we shut down streets and they have to find a detour. But, you know, that's public works. And we have to improve the streets, you know, not only for condition, but the safety of the resident. And then we actually have our maintenance department. So we have close to 200 pieces of equipment through all the departments in the entire uh, community. Our fleet maintenance was part of our maintenance. have three dedicated mechanics that actually maintain not only equipment you see in our barn here, but, you know, the fire department, the police department, you know, the health department, their vehicles, and all those vehicles. And then on top of that, we actually have two maintenance uh, specialists that maintain all our buildings. Um, those buildings basically, um, they got to go through and make sure do minor maintenance and, and keep them up and going. Then I got my, you know, I call it my foundation of my operation. I got my admin staff up front. Um, they, it's amazing what the, our front office team does. You know, when the calls and complaints come in, a lot of times they can address them and deal with them, but they know how to uh, direct the calls to get them to the right, uh, you know, departments and that sort of thing. So you pretty much handle the streets above, yep. you know, and below. Yes, so sir. the pipes, the whole yep. infrastructure. Yep. So when a resident gets a bill, the water bill, the sewer bill, it's not just the, you know, the physical water itself we get in and, and the sewage, etc. but it's all the other stuff that goes with it. There's many, many things that goes with it. And what people don't realize, as you indicated, the, you, you don't, I, they call it out of sight, out of mind. The utilities that are in the street are unbelievable. Not only you have your water, your sewer, you have storm sewer. You have your gas, you know, you got your you know, power, you got cable and that sort of thing. So that's all tied in their streets and all part of the engineering part. So when we get a street rebuilt, yep. the city's involved with that. Yes. You know, as far as the pipes are concerned, hooking up with the houses, all that kind of stuff. Correct, correct. Um, it's a very entailed um, process. Now we collaborate with other communities um, for a wide range of services whether it be for uh, MSC engineering, water, etc. Can you give us some examples of collaborations with other communities? Many years ago the I call it the Brown County uh, Director of Public Works Association we created this group of all the uh, area public works directors they meet at least on a quarterly basis to, to kind of talk about issues that are going on in the community each community um, different things going on and you know what we do in the pair you know are done similar in other communities like this time of year we all plow streets so we meet on a regular basis to talk about issues and uh, things we can do to you know join forces different things and from that those meetings we started doing a lot more collaboration and basically what that means is we work with a lot of communities to try to save our taxpayers money. And what I mean by that, for example, is, you know, if we can help another community out, 
Um, they have a piece of equipment that we don't. You know, can we borrow that equipment? So after, you know, several years ago, the, all the elected officials approved an agreement to share services. Uh, and and that, what that means is, you know, we need to borrow equipment or, you know, we need a body to help them out. But there's individual pieces of equipment that are seasonal that, you know, one community may not be needing right away. It might cost a hundred grand, um, but we need once or twice a year. You know, so we'd reach out to say Green Bay and say, hey, do you have uh, this piece of equipment we could borrow? And instead of, you know, they don't charge us rent, they don't uh, charge us any fees, it's just part of that agreement to share costs. And we actually went a step further and we get doing a lot more collaboration. We started joint bidding and actually putting our proposals together because what that does is we have common things we all do. So, you know, it saves us pricing for each community versus doing it one. One big project that we collaborated many years ago, I think it was 2014, we went along with the Central Brown County Water Authority, along with City of Appleton and Grand Chute, and we did a full meter replacement, water meter replacement. And these meters are what we, how we read, how much water we use, and that's what it's built. And I can tell you, the pier alone saved hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars by collaborating with that group for the cost of the meters versus you know, us going alone. So little ideas like that, the collaboration has been a great thing for not only our operations, but for the community as well, because not only it provides more services, but at an affordable price. Well, that's great. Uh, very, very entailed. Um, so you talked about seasonal. What are some differences between the seasons as far as the workload with your staff? You have spring, you know, you know, versus fall. You've got summer versus winter. Yep. What, what goes into some of those decisions? What are the operations? Well, public work is seasonal. And we say it every year. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, the old, the old movie Groundhog's Day. You, you know, right now we're into the winter months. It's snow season. Um, our engineer, engineering department, for example, summer months of construction. Um, you know, the old saying is around in Wisconsin, it's either barrel season for construction or it's winter. Um, you know, in the winter months, our, our engineering department is looking at uh, planning, designing, and the projects for next year. So every year that rotates, you know, different place, different thing. Seasonal work for a street department, for example. We have, like I mentioned earlier, snow plow season. We only do that during the winter months, but summer months we're doing everything for um, pavement uh, maintenance to um, striping our streets to actually street sweeping. Um, spring, we're doing yard waste uh, collection and brush collection. Fall, we're doing heavy leaf collection and the brush collection. And our fleet maintenance is kind of seasonal. You know, going into winter months, and um, we talk about prepping our uh, snowplow equipment. Well, in the spring months, they're prepping our equipment we need for spring things. You know, our water department, for example, there's things they do in summer months because you you know the water and you don't want it to freeze, like flushing hydrants and things like that. So everything everything's seasonal. Wow. So obviously we're in winter mode right now, so you're all geared up for the, for the winter season. One question I get a lot from residents is, how are roads prioritized as to, you know, does something get plowed first? You know, how, how do you go ahead with making those decisions? Are those decisions already made? We got a snow event coming up. Take us through that. So it's a very good question. So first of all, I'm going to set my mask got down here a little bit because I got a few things I want to show. Okay, we can, we're just setting Frosty down, so just one moment here. We're actually laying Frosty down, so just one moment. It's cold enough in here, so Frosty will be fine. Frosty kids will be at home. fine, you won't melt, kids. So yep. it's a very good question. It's probably a good question to explain to the community. So one of our challenges that we have as staff is planning you know, the forecast. Um, majority time they're right, but sometimes you can't plan it. I mean, we got a big event that's coming now, potentially depending on the track, we could get minimal snow or no snow. And we rely on that. Uh, our street superintendent, Tony Feetzer, and I, we're constantly monitoring the weather forecast to plan. And, I mean, unfortunately, majority of the time they're right, but sometimes we're planning for eight inches of snow, we get zero. Sometimes when so we get a dusting, we get six inches. So we've got to be ready to go. So we actually have four different aspects of our winter operation when it comes to plowing. We have anti-icing. We have salting. We have snow, uh, uh, the actual snow plow removal, and then we got cleanup, I call it. So one of the things is a, a lot of what we got going on is the different phases of operation. We'll, we'll talk about anti-icing first. So do you cook, Mayor? I do cook. Okay, so if you don't want anything to burn in your fry pan, what do you normally put I'll in I'll put there? some oil down. Exactly. So anti-icing is what you'll see is our trucks. When the temperatures are above 15 degrees, they basically put a salt brine down. We have the equipment to make salt brine, which is 
you know, uh, one ton of salt and a thousand gallons of water makes a brine. And we put that down. Is so we'll see that liquid. The liquid go we'll, down. On the ground, we'll see it. And that'll go on our primary roads. And I'll talk a minute about our primary roads when we get into plowing. Is that it's like that oil in a fry pan. It's like a agent that goes down is on a primary roads where a majority of the traffic are. We don't want that snow to pack on. So it acts like a bonding, you know, to break that bond so it doesn't stick. So that's one aspect of our operations. That works great when it's 15 degrees or warmer. When it gets colder, it's tough to do that anti-icing. The next thing we have is we actually have salting. Um, so we actually have a great partnership with our police department. You know, they have patrol 24-7. So after hours, for example, if we get a dusting or snow and the uh, roads get slippery, we actually, they'll call the, um, our street superintendent, if he's not available, myself, we need salters out. So we got six salters out. And basically, we have maps that go out. So we call in six people. You know, each individual comes in, grabs a truck with a route. There's three in the west, three in the east. And basically, what we do with the salting operations is they go out and spread salt on our primaries, and then they hit in our residential areas. They hit the intersections, mid-block hills, curves, that sort of thing. That typically takes three hours. Um, the next aspect of that is our snow operations, which is snow removal. And one of the things I got to stress to the public is that our typical uh, plow operations does not occur until there's a, you know, three inches or more of snow accumulation. That went to the Board of Public Works last year just to reaffirm that policy. And that's kind of the policy that's been on board since I got here. So what we got behind And me, that's fairly standard across the state, most well, likely. Well, it's fairly most standard. Most municipalities. Most municipalities. There are some that have been we'll as high as four. Some has been as low as two. Sure, but there's a number the majority that will, that will move you into your process. Yes, okay. yes, sir. And that's part of the things we talk about, to be honest with you, when we talk about collaboration. Our neighboring communities and our, typically our street superintendent are talking about when you plow and when you're going out, that sort of thing. Sure. You know, because you help each other make the call. But what we got is kind of unique here. We actually have, when we go out and plow, we get that three inches. We have all these various routes that are throughout the city. You'll see... You know, 79, that's truck 79, 76. Um, we have actually various, uh, you know, these different routes that go, each staff is assigned. The unique thing about the street department, we don't have enough staff in our street department to fill all our equipment. So we borrow from the parks department and other divisions because we have 16 different pieces of equipment. On our street-wise size, we got eight trucks. We got this grader, we have three loaders that actually plow. Then we have what we call a, a holder, it's a, kind of a, like a, a machine that goes down all our alleys. And then we have three different trucks to go and plow all our public works uh, parking lots and facility. And what happens here, what you'll see is you have the greens and you have the reds. So when we go out, you know, that one inch or, uh, you know, less type of thing, all these green routes are areas that we consider primaries. They may be major arterials or industrial parks, that sort of thing. Or they may be, for an example, a thoroughfare, for example, if I go on the east side, um, that basically connects, you know, streets from one, like Jordan Road, I'll give you a, you got Beaumere to um, South Broadway. So people, a lot of people cut through, so they go take Beaumere to get over to South Broadway, or mm -hmm. consider the primary. Sure. So they get the attention first when we go out and plow. So then once, you know, each individual has their route, um, you know, they hit the primaries first, then they jump into secondaries which is called the, the areas in, in red. And those are usually the last to get plowed, um, you know, after any event. We typically plow, majority of the time, we like to plow at night, but Mother Nature doesn't bring the snow, you know, when, she, you know, when we want it. Sure. So it takes about a six hours to plow anything, six inches or less. And a lot of these, if you see cul-de-sacs, will go up here, you know, you go off of, uh, say, Ridgeway Boulevard, those cul-de-sacs or uh, other areas in the community come off of uh, South Ninth, those cul-de-sacs typically are hit last. People are always asking, well, why, you know, why am I the last to get plowed? Well, your low volume, dead end street or, you know, it's not the criteria. We have to hit the green areas first and then we jump into the red. So it's your plan does, I mean, your plan is already in place. It yep. doesn't change per event. Yep. You already have something yep. that you can rely on as far as when you, yep. when you dispatch yep. and when you go out. Exactly. And it's a general policy because the reason I say that is there are times is, for example, if we get two and a half inches of really wet snow and it's going to be 10 below next week, um, a lot of times we'll, you'll, we'll go out and clean it. Or say we had today it snows two inches 
and then Friday snows another two that accumulate. We'll go out and try to clean the streets up. But majority of the rule is is we typically, you know, it's a three inch before we plow. Sure. Now, now your drivers obviously we could have a snow event that's two days. You know, who knows? Yes. They can't go for two consecutive nope. days. So how does how does that work? I mean, what's what's the general rotation or how long can a shift be? That's one of the things about our team here. We have dedicated employees that you know they know their their main job is snow removal in the winter months. And I hate to say it, I mean, typically, an ideal world, you know, you plow, you go home, but we've had events that, um, you know, we basically go um, 16 hours, they go home for a quick six or eight, come back for another 16, and that might be for three, four days straight, depending on the event. The other part of the event I didn't get into, and this is where we have extended days, is we get six inches, you know, after we do that snow removal, the fourth part of the operation is what I call snow cleanup. So, you know, First of all, all the snow in our parking lots and that sort of thing, we haul away um, to our snow dumps. We have a snow dump up here on the east side, and we have one here on the west side. So we all we haul all that snow away. Then in our downtown areas, you know, we want to make sure the terraces, you know, like your house, for example, you may have a three-foot terrace full of snow. Sure. Well, you don't need to get through that to get to your house, but these businesses, for example, do. And so what we try to do is when the snow banks get high enough, we schedule a midnight cleanup and our crews come in and then at midnight pull all the snow from the downtown areas and haul them away. That's a cleanup. So then what they do is they come in at midnight, they're working until 3 or 4 the next day. So if they plow, for example, on a Tuesday, because we come in at midnight and they plow from midnight, they go through their through shift the next day, that's 14 to 16 hours. They go, we're doing a cleanup tonight and now they come back in. Okay. So it's typical that actually, um, you know, they can run two, three days straight or 16 hour days, you know, we need to get them that break. You know, our staff are on call, available 24 seven. They work days and nights, nights and days, holidays. And, you know, and that's what it really takes to um, provide the snow removal and try to provide safe roads to the community. Great, so we know the city staff has responsibilities, so do you as well. Residents also have responsibilities during a snow event. Yes. You know, so can you go through some of those Absolutely. things? Absolutely, the community are people driving, whether it's you or me, um, you know, driving down the roads. We have responsibilities, you know, driving in bad condition. One, you shouldn't be out there if you don't need to be, but make sure your car's got the tires, um, you're giving yourself enough time. You know, you can't stop on a dime in, in, in the winter months. As you look at the size of these trucks, we're gonna win and you're gonna lose in a battle. There's so give, give, the equipment, give the equipment proper distance and proper, proper distance. space. Um, so talk about residents, what they gotta do. You just got done, Mayor, snow blowing in your yard. Yep. We didn't come through yet, guess what? We're filling your driveway. That's one of the biggest complaints I get. Our job is to clear the snow from the streets. We fill drivers, that's my job, that's our job. People get so mad and irritated that they see us go through, they take their blower and they're blowing it out into the uh, street again, which is a no-no. Um, that is by ordinance, I can come by, if you blow your snow mirror in the driveway, and come by and we'll issue a, a ticket, a costly ticket. Um, people are mad and I get it and stuff like that, but people be patient and realize, you know, that's what we do. That's what you have to do. The other thing is people gotta realize when it's snowing out, if you don't have to, don't park on the street. We have large equipment. We have to, we're going down the road, we're plowing against the curb, you're parked in the street, and I, we gotta swing out, and we come you know, back, and that might be across your, not the lot before you, your, your neighbor on one side, you, and then the neighbor on the other side, and we're not coming back to clean it up. So if you don't have to park on the street, then don't park on the street because it allows us to do our job um, more efficiently and clear the snow. In fact, during major events, we have major events, I'll work with the police chief, and we'll have a snow emergency that actually um, no parking is allowed in any street. And those will be posted on our website, yes. you know, Facebook. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, we'll obviously feed the information to the media as yes. well. So yes. that definitely is where you want to be off the streets. Oh, absolutely. Well, you have to be off the streets. Absolutely. And the next big thing is, it is by our, our ordinance that you have 48 hours to remove all snow or ice from your sidewalk. 48 hours. 48 hours from the last time of snow, we track it. We know when the snow stops sure. and we start getting complaints and we are limited on staff and we only handle people that um, call in. So if you called and you know, gave me my, an address, say it's my address because I didn't shovel, you will wait 40 hours, staff will go and inspect. There is no warning, there is no letter, no knock on the door type of a thing. We'll see, yep, it wasn't shoveled. Our crews go out there, they actually remove the snow and you get a nice bill. Um, and it can be very costly. And, you know, 
that the amount we charge every year is actually set by our Board of Public Works. It's based on the linear feet of, um, you know, the length of your lot. Um, you know, there's two different charges. If it's compacted ice, it's more expensive because we've got to go through a couple times sure. with, uh, you know, uh, salt and that sort of thing. And then people ask, well, I can't get out there. It's too cold. Nothing works. One of the things they can do is show there was an effort. You shoveled your sidewalk. It's clear. we got compacted snow and ice. You can't get it off because it's 10 below. You tried. It, you tried. As long as you showed you threw salt down on it or get cat litter. Sprinkle some cat litter down there. You want cat that litter. traction. Um, you know, basically, staff will go out there and look, yep, you know, it's cold. I, we get it. So long as you showed the effort, you so removed the snow, you threw salt down or cat litter or something, thing, we're not going to, you know, come back and charge you. So sidewalks are not just yep. for the residents. The homeowner's protection yep. Yep. It's for everyone else's protection as well. Absolutely. So businesses and homeowners, yes. please, please, yep. for, the, for the community, do that. Take care of your and sidewalks. There's a lot of people that are, you know, disabled or sick or elderly that can't do snow removal. We'll work with them. Maybe just, you know, Boulder sidewalk. Help, help them out. Help them out because, you know, we know there's a lot of people that can't do it. You know, work as neighbors to help each other and volunteer and, and, and do the snow removal. And by and large, it should be noted, most residents do a great job of Absolutely. taking care of their sidewalks. Absolutely. Uh, and, and doing what we're asking of them Absolutely. to do for the benefit of the whole community. Absolutely. In your neighborhood, do you have a fire hydrant by your uh, house? Somewhere nearby, yes. Okay. So our fire hydrants typically are, you know, mid blocks or intersection. We ask those that have a hydrant by their house is, you know, if they can clear the snow around it. And the reason for that is we don't, um, you know, if there's a fire um, and a fire department can't get access at to it or they have to shovel to get at that hydrant, then it, it delays by minutes, you know, them putting out a fire if you had a fire at your house. So we, we call it adopt a, a hydrant. So in the winter months, you got the hydrant, you know, by you, whatever else, um, basically, is you know make sure it's clear that's a great request so we've talked about snow uh the events and what happens and what goes into the process what other big projects does public works have coming up in the near or far future well it's a very good question so as i indicated earlier with our engineering department we're constantly you know right now not only wrapping up projects but we're putting projects out to bid um, for next year already so um, the city engineer and his team is working on actually um, you know, design and projects. Some of the projects you'll, you'll see going on next summer. If you haven't been on the west side, for example, on American Boulevard, you see all the construction going on due to the ex, uh, expansion, the Green Bay packaging. You got Georgia Pacific. We're actually extending the utilities and actually the road all the way down to the city border down there to accommodate that actually project. On our east side industrial park, we're going to be extending Commerce Drive. They'll actually now tie from um, Heritage Road onto Rockland Road. I believe we have a couple new subdivisions that are actually coming online that we'll be designing going out to bid uh, next year. Um, Planning-wise, we're in the works. Um, if you haven't heard it yet, it's up and coming. Um, uh, the Department of Transportation is doing a major um, widening on 41. Um, that's actually from Sharing Road area and the pier all the way to Appleton. And they're, they're actually anticipating, I believe, in 24, 25 to start construction. And it's going to be similar to what we had from Sharing Road going to Lineville, probably a six, seven year, pro, uh, year project. But as part of that project, the DOT has actually um, approved a new interchange at Southbridge. So we're working with the county right now. Actually, they're going out to uh, solicit designs for um, uh, engineering firms. We're, we have to be able to um, between Lawrence and actually De Pere, they're going to be, when the DOT builds that interchange, we need to tie into it. So in our aspect, you know, the county will be building the tie-in for the new interchange from Lawrence Drive to 41. That's anticipated to happen in, in 2025. Um, so, you know, that's going to be uh, down the road a couple of years. Um, you know, there's always DOT projects coming on. Um, you know, we just got word, for example, that uh, Main Avenue, and read uh, basically from the bridge to A Street. Uh, the DOT is trying to put back on their, uh, I believe, six-year highway plan to come in and rehab that. You know, so and we, we say DOT and highway plan. It's yeah. Highway 32. Highway 32. Yep, yep. Thank you on that. So it's a uh, It's um, it's a basically a DOT highway, but they're going to fund do the major you know um, repairs and uh, pavement uh, uh, maintenance on that. Um, 
one of the things that you're aware at the council the other night, it's not really a city project, but I need to let everybody know is TDS. It's a uh, utility company that's going to be installing fiber optic throughout the entire community. Um, you know, every street will have it. Every yard, every property owner will be impacted on it. Their, their intent is actually to bring in uh, fiber optic to every property um, and, and potentially offer not only, you know, uh, the fiber, but also, you know, TV. Um, that starts next summer, and I'll be going probably a year and a half to two years. And what it is is going to give, you know, the residents of the community and in businesses another opportunity other than AT&T, for example, and, and um, Spectrum, they'll have another option. But that's going to be, it's one of the largest utility projects this city will ever, has ever seen. Yeah, it's a very, um, very big project very to big the point project. we're probably going to have a whole separate mayor's corner that most yep. likely will deal with that Correct. project because it's going to affect so many so residents many and people, businesses. So many yeah. people, it's just a huge... I mean, it's a great heads up and we yep. did just talk about it but as we get closer to it. Uh, we're definitely going to have to bring you back and, and have more discussion and make the people aware what's going on. Um, all right, so we talked about a snow event and how um, you keep the streets you know, safe during that. And the city of De Pere on uh, our production department went out um, during a snow plow event. Um, so we'd like to show that to the residents right now. That was really cool to see. And, and by the way, personally, I was on um, one of the snowplow trucks last winter and got to see firsthand um, how they go through the whole process and, um, uh, and the challenges that they face and how it's really important for residents to be aware of the snowplow drivers because, you know, they're, they're, they're at risk as well, too, um, and, and trying to keep the, the streets safe. So that was, a, that was an incredible segment. Hey, um, seriously, thanks a lot for being here, Scott, learning all about the Public Works Department, all that you do um, for the city of De Pere. You wear many hats not just the hat you have on your head um, with, the, uh, with the Christmas holiday season, but with engineering, the streets division, everything, I think it's important for residents to realize um, the role that you play and, and all the Public Works employees um, for the citizens of the pier. So thank you. Thank you very much. Happy holidays, Mayor. Thank you very much. And now for a few city updates. On December 7th, I presented a commendation to the winners of the 2021 City of De Pere Photo Contest. Citizens submitted photos to the contest over the summer in a variety of categories, including cityscapes, environment and nature, recreation and health, and community engagement and special events. More than 200 photos were submitted and five winners were chosen. 
The winning photos will be on display in the lobby of City Hall for the next year. Thanks to all those who submitted photos, we are proud to see how you have captured our beautiful city. We hope you are able to enjoy this year's holiday lights display at Voyager Park. For this inaugural 2021 season, more than 20 trees were lit, averaging 500 to 750 lights per tree. We're here, we are certainly not the biggest light show in town, uh, or even in the county for that matter, but we are a free program. We're here, you know, it's a very nice uh, light show that people can enjoy, get out, uh, you know, and just do something outside. Thanks to our Parks Department for taking on the event and providing the citizens of De Pere an extra holiday activity for friends and family alike. December 15th was a special day for the De Pere Health Department. The department hosted its 100th vaccine clinic at the De Pere Community Center. This particular clinic was for adults 18 years or older and offered first time doses of Johnson & Johnson while offering boosters of Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. We've worked really hard to keep our community as safe as possible. As soon as the vaccines came in, we started vaccinating. We want COVID over with just as much as everybody else does, if not more. And so we want to try to provide the vaccine for people here in De Pere who might not be able to go elsewhere. We want to do as much for our community as we can. If you live in the city of De Pere and are seeking a vaccination, head to the health department page at tapirewi.gov to find out more. Finally, I want to personally offer a happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year to you, the residents of De Pere. 2021, much like 2020, had its challenges, but we continue to see progress and positivity in our city. We have seen new businesses and cultural centers break ground. We as a community have safely held events that were previously on hold. Many of us have been able to spend holidays with loved ones again. The best is yet to come for the city of De Pere, and I can't wait to see what 2022 brings our great community. That's it for another Mayor's Corner. We'll see you again soon with another behind the scenes look at the city of De Pere and all that De Pere has to offer. I'm Mayor James Boyd.